Okay. Hi everyone. Today I'm going to be talking about how to apply to PhD programs in chemical engineering in the United States. It was quite surprising to me that there wasn't a video like this on YouTube. So I thought that the best way to to inform those specifically applying to chemical engineering PhD programs, uh, most likely for fall 2021, be aware of um, certain things that they can do to help them uh, gain an advantage. So I'll, I'll give some background on me. So I did my bachelor's of engineering and chemical engineering. Uh, I went directly from bachelor's to PhD program. Uh, right now I'm currently at the end of my PhD, so I'm working on completing my thesis. I ended up applying to about 12 programs. Uh, in total, and I got accepted to six, and all of those were in chemical engineering. Uh, but however, what I will talk about that's quite interesting is that I had the ability to apply to a lot more programs based on um, fee waivers that I had, and I'll elaborate on that a little bit further. So what are the main things you need to be aware of? Uh, you'll need research experience, of course, in order to get into a PhD program. Uh, very seldom will you get into one without it. Uh, you'll need to, of course, network, and this will happen, you know, pre and post uh, 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 application submitting. You'll need to uh, do the GRE, because I'll talk about a little bit later. This is a requirement that's being waived uh, more and more with the passing years. In the statement of purpose, and I'll talk a little bit more about what exactly should be in that document. You'll also need an application package, uh, and this will, you know, require things that are stated above as well as a, uh, a few more things to be um, considerate of. Uh, additionally, uh, be aware of your spring semester availability, especially if you're a a currently a senior applying uh, to programs for fall 2021. And finally, just funding and things to uh, consider as you move to the PhD and are thinking about what your career options should be. So first I'll talk about research experience. And you'll notice that this is a quite bland document. It's mainly because I want this to be short and simple and easy for those to read. So it's really helpful to have done at least one to two summers of research. You don't necessarily need to do research during the semester, but it's certainly helpful. I know a lot of people that have done that. Maybe they'll do it for like research experience, like an independent study, for example, which is um, what students that, that work under me have done in the past. So I'll give some uh, examples of what I've done. Uh, I worked for a shark field research lab during one of my summers. This was after my sophomore year, and I did research for one of my for one of the professors in my department um, during my the, the end of my junior year and throughout my senior year. And what really helps is to be able to speak on those experiences in your statement of purpose, and I'll talk more on that later. But research is extremely important. So networking is also important, right? Uh, networking. Uh, helps mainly because you can get a couple of fee waivers from there, but also helps you to meet professors that are typically um, running uh, uh, career fair tables. So for me, I attended the Nesby National Convention in my junior spring. Uh, so I talked to a few chemical engineering departments there, and I was a much more targeted, so I knew which schools I wanted to talk to when I went to the AICHE National Convention, or some people would call it AICHE. Uh, I also reached out to as many chemical engineering departments as possible throughout this time. Um, and so I did, so this part is crucial because I did this part actually when I was uh, to, towards my summer, um, summer summer of my junior year. So what I did here is that I, I emailed the graduate coordinators or um, the admissions chairs of as many chemical engineering school, uh, po uh, departments as possible. And this helped me to obtain fee waivers. Um, so essentially I applied to graduate school for free. So what I did was I obtained about 25 fee waivers, um, to different programs in total. And I ended up only applying to about 12 of those. Um, and so this is really important because this helps you to save money in this application process. You know, we're all undergraduates. We're not making as much money. So this helps us to save as much as possible. So really the only thing I ended up paying for at this point was, um, the GRE, and I had to pay for the GRE in full because I'm an international student. So, um, and of course you can save, and so uh, the GRE allows you to, to send up to four scores for free um, within the $200 fee. So that helps a lot. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the GRE on the next slide. 
So quantity score is extremely important. Uh, you should have, you know, about 160 or above to be considered competitive. Uh, but nowadays, a lot of chemical engineering departments have waived this requirement. It's not really needed per se. I know it's especially true for my school and other schools um, that are particularly like top 20 to top 50. So that should result in a lot of savings on your end. Uh, however, the GRE might be a crucial determinant in how your application proceeds, especially if you're coming from a smaller chemical engineering department like myself. So there's things to be aware of. But I studied a lot for the GRE. Uh, I wanted to do as well as possible. And uh, when I applied, which is in 2016, it was something that was, um, which all chemical and engineering departments required, M mainly all the graduate programs required. But I will mention that the GRE is not, um, uh, uh, is not a good, is not the greatest indicator of whether or not you will succeed in graduate school. So statement of purpose is really important as well. I started drafting this during my during my uh, junior summer, and you know I had a really really rough draft. It took me you know about 10, 15 iterations just to get it right. But once I got it right, you talk about the following things. You want to talk about in the first two paragraphs your interest in the school you're applying to and which advisors you want to work you want to work with. Uh, I kind of pooled up what the different research uh, research areas are. Uh, below, so it's typically you know biotech, uh, cellular engineering, molecular biology, uh, energy, catalysis, electrochemistry, which is where I work in, uh, polymers, computational modeling, so things like molecular dynamics, uh, DFT, other kinds of uh, uh, large larger scale dynamics. Uh, you also want to talk about what experiences have led you to applying, or what those experiences uh, taught you. So uh, 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 apart from my research, I also had a lot of experience with. Um, process engineering because I worked at a pharmaceutical plant for uh, for for a summer at that point and so I already had completed another internship there while I was waiting to um, come back to the U.S. for graduate school and you know I was really able to, to talk about how you know having having industry experience really allows you to understand more about what are the things that are needed in industry like what kind of research areas are are to uh, um are important to you at least that help you to gain better understanding to help uh, improve industrial processes, right? Because you know there's a lot of research that occurs, especially in the pharmaceutical industry, um, and there's a lot of demand there for PhDs. So I think that's something to um, to talk about, particularly for me. Uh, when, when I applied to graduate, I was actually interested in doing um, biology research, so things along the lines of cellular engineering. Um, but it didn't work out that way for me. I kind of had a switch in interest. So it's something to, con it's something to consider, right? Tying in things that aren't necessarily research focused um, towards something that makes you a, a, a stronger PG candidate. Even, you know, the Shark Out research was really interesting to talk about because like, you know, whether it's field research or, you know, in lab research, the skills are, the skills are, sort, of, are sort of the same. Can you, can you manage your time? Can you, um, can you come up with, with, a solid plan for conducting research. Um, do you have the tenacity? Do you have the the stamina to complete research for long periods of time? Right, and so field research is quite rigorous in that in that aspect. So your act your application packet should have the following things, and I've already talked about a few of these: statement of purpose, GRE, unofficial scores, unofficial copy of your official transcript. So these two things I think are really important to outline because um, what I did. Sometimes, sometimes, uh, sometimes in the application portal, it would say, "Okay, you need to submit your official scores." But usually, what I what I did was I asked the school, um, I would ask the the point of contact for that department if they needed these scores or not officially before they could uh, make a decision on my admission. And most of the times, they said no. So what I did was I just submitted the unofficial scores, my GRE and my and my official transcript copy. And then if I got accepted to the school and I and I accepted the offer, I would then submit uh, my scores, and that helped save a lot of money as well. Um, some schools have had an additional diversity essay, and this like strongly depends. Most schools do not have this. Uh, there's the application and the app fee. Of course, you know if you have fee waivers, you can disregard the app fee. You just put in like a code, uh, valid address, and phone number, because sometimes departments will call you, um, and they'll send the official acceptance letter to your to your uh, 
per, to your current address. And then finally, the country of citizenship. So for me, um, obviously since I'm an international student, I had to provide this information. All right, so spring semester availability. So some schools will pre-screen. Um, like they'll just you know have a quick chat with you, but you usually accept to just get an acceptance without any contact. So now that you've been accepted to a school, uh, make sure to block out your schedule during the spring, most important visits. For chemical engineering students, it's really difficult because at that time we're, we're completing capstone or our thesis. And we can leave for like weekends at a time where that's time where you're typically working with teammates to complete that work. So just be very considerate to your teammates and let them be aware of this at the beginning of the semester. Um, you might have to pay for flights, but some schools will take these costs up front. Um, hotel rooms are... Um, more than likely provided. You won't have to pay for this at all up front. But flights are a maybe. Most schools will pay for the flight up front. Um, have an idea ahead of time which process you want to talk to. Schools will reach out to you before um, this process and they help you to kind of figure out the schedule. Um, graduate students typically will um, deal with this part. Uh, make sure to network and talk to the other visiting students. You'll end up meeting them on subsequent visits, especially if you're applying to schools in a particular um, ranking, quote-unquote ranking. Um, and then finally, you have until April 15th to choose or decline a school's offer. So this is typically, you know, like right before, like the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, and so what you want to do is you want to respectfully decline offers. Um, you want to definitely do this before the deadline. Um, do not have, you know, please, graduate coordinators spend a lot of time um, planning uh, 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 recruit, re recruiting events. So please do not waste their time. Um, by having them chase after you to like let them know what your decision is. And then finally, uh, funding and outlook. So um, for me, as an international student, you have to get your F1. Uh, so I already had an F1 visa. So since it was a five-year visa and it took me four years to complete my degree, uh, I was able to, um, to stay on the same visa um, for one more year. I just needed a new uh, I-20. So I had the I-20 sent to me during the summer. Um, if you went to like a... If you had a gap year at a school that's such an undergraduate, the, the school you're doing your PhD, they will ask you to send in that transcript. So it's really important that you continue to keep those contacts and you send in your transcript um, before the semester starts, else you might run into some issues. Well, what's important to know is that STEM PhDs are always typically funded. This is, this is definitely true for PhDs, um, especially in chemical engineering. Uh, in chemical engineering, you typically do not enter with an advisor. Um, very seldom departments do this, but most of the time you'll pick in it. You will pick in it, like your top three choices for an advisor during the middle or the end of your PhD program. Uh, just a quick tip: your first semester is the toughest, so stay focused. Um, form study groups, talk to people, um, stay engaged, um, reach out to TAs and professors um, just to get more understanding of the material. Typically, you'll take you know transport kinetics. Uh, a math class, and you'll take uh, molecular thermodynamics. Uh, PhDs are in high demand in industry, um, particularly in consulting, uh, biotechnology, pharmaceutical companies, or pharmaceutical industry, and data science, uh, tech, tech industries in general. So these are just some things to be considered. But of course, you know, um, PhDs in engineering are in high demand, are in high demand, relatively speaking, um, uh, much more in these industries. Uh, fully immerse yourself into the process, you know, like you'll be attending seminars during your first semester. There'll be a lot of free food, hopefully, if you're going back um, and uh, things aren't, you know, like as bad as they are now, particularly with the pandemic. Um, just, you know, like you'll be able to talk to professors and, um, and, and be engaged and live in a new area. So um, there's a lot that's very exciting, but do not be too overwhelmed with it since the first semester will require a lot of your attention. Finally, al align your research interests of where you want to be in the future. This is extremely important. Um, do something that you know that you'll love that will help guide where you think you want to be. But of course, recognize that there's some flexibility that can be allowed here since, you know, you will definitely have a change of heart within, within the five years, right? You will learn more about what academia requires of you. It's the whole purpose of the PhD. It's kind of like you um, learning more about what it's like to be a researcher and you become slowly and slowly more independent as you go through this process. So that's all I wanted to say. I wanted to, you know, have a guide for how chemical engineering PhD students should go about with applying for this. And I wanted to make it as simple as possible. Um, if you like this video, please um, like it and feel free to subscribe if you'd like to in order to follow up or um, stay in touch with other things that I'll be um, 
providing quick guides on. So thank you.